From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. Speaker Nicholas Mattiello made headlines on day one of the new legislative session announcing the House will seriously consider new gun laws this year. Add that to the list of issues Smith Hill expects to tackle this session, along with the governor's soon-to-be-released budget proposal and her expected push to legalize marijuana. On the first half of Newsmakers, the perspective from GOP House Minority Leader Blake Filippi. Then, one year in news is hard enough. Try 50, a milestone for a legendary Rhode Island newsman running the West Bay's most influential newspaper. Our guest on the second half of Newsmakers, the publisher of the Warwick Beacon, John Howell. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Joining me on the program, as always, Eyewitness News reporter Ted Nisi. House Minority Leader Blake Filippi, it's good to have you on the show. Welcome Thanks back. For me. Thank you for having me. So the speaker raised some eyebrows in his opening remarks uh, to start the session when he said he's going to, he is open, excuse me, to passing new laws uh, this year regulating guns. This may include cross notification with police chiefs when someone buys a gun outside their community, a central statewide computer system to share information among communities, and banning uh, 3D guns. Do you support the speaker on this? I, I think we always need to be deliberate when we're talking about one of our fundamental rights, restricting it. I believe there is a state statute right now on the books that requires the state police or your local police department to be notified. Whether that's been adhered to, I think, might be the question, and whether we need to just say not the state police but your local police. Well, there's better. a patchwork of laws. You have concealed carry permits, and the, the notification has to happen there. But right now, if someone in, you know, buys a gun, well, the case in Westerly. Yes. If, uh, the, the suspected shooter in Westerly, uh, you can't, I don't think there's a gun shop in Westerly, but he purchased the gun in Richmond. So the idea here, the proposal would be uh, that the police chief in Westerly would have to be notified if a gun is bought outside the community. Do you support that? So it, it depends, the devil's in the, de in the details, right? Because we w have laws in the books that prevent a statewide database of gun owners. So I want to make sure that how the information is transmitted complies with our laws about not maintaining a database. Now why, I'm sorry, why is it important? And you're right, there is a, a law in a federal law on not having, a, say, a gun registry. Why is that important to you? Because I think if you look at history, the Second Amendment, the purpose of the Second Amendment, the real purpose was to protect people from a tyrann tyrannical government. And if that were ever to be needed, I don't think Then why do we have a DMV? A DMV? Well, so I know it's a, the cars aren't a constitutional thing, but there, the government <laughs> keeps track of a lot of, of information. Yes. Uh, is it solely the constitutional angle to you that is important why there shouldn't be a registry uh, for, for guns? And then the practical angle. The practical angle. I mean, we always like to think that we're different, but I look back at 5,000 years of human history and a people that can defend themselves is the greatest protection against the government that's gone awry. Um, we have many of my progressive friends who are saying that they think, you know, our federal government has a fascist element to it. I don't necessarily agree with that, but I don't think at the same time you can take that position and also say people should not have firearms. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. I think people have a fundamental right to protect their families and their communities. And I would be nervous about a gun registry. Uh, if we ever had to exercise that right. And I think because we have that right, we'll never need it. How about the proposal to ban 3D guns and so-called ghost guns? That's another one that seems to come up. What do you think of that? So I, I'm actually interested in that. The 3D guns, I don't think that someone should be able to print a firearm that can be used. I'm, I'm concerned about 3D, 3D guns. I'm learning about ghost guns. Uh, I don't really have enough information to, to make a comment on ghost guns now. Uh, if someone wants to build a firearm, uh, I need to know more about it. I really do. I, I look forward to the committee process. But 3D guns, I, I'm concerned about. The budget deficit at last check stood at $200 million, barring a sudden influx of unanticipated revenue. What is the primary way you propose in closing that gap? You know, I think we need to have more efficient operations of government. Uh, our departments are overspending. Uh, I don't want to raise taxes. But if you look at DCYF, if you look at operations in the Department of Administra in Administration, they need to submit corrective action plans to us about how they're going to correct their uh, failure to apply, uh, adhere to the budget. So how, how are we going to, going to close it? I think we need to manage government better. I don't think we have a choice. You yeah. want to know specifically 
specifically where we're going yeah, to so cut. Man, man, I mean, ev everyone says, well, we have to manage the government better, we have to cut down on fraud and waste. That is just, those are nebulous terms, leader, that really th don't get it to the heart of what you might see as areas that could be trimmed. Clearly, you don't want to increase revenue, so you have to cut it. Okay, so if, if the, the choice, if we're at the point where the choice is between maintaining, let's say, the car tax phase out versus raising taxes, I would get rid of the car tax phase out. Really? Mm. I would. The speaker would say that that's, that's a non-negotiable. Well, I look forward to him finding a different way. I think he, he's a reasonable man, and if they can find another way, but I don't think the car tax phase-out is fair. It's not fair because communities like the ones I represent have been responsible. They didn't have high car taxes, but it is the communities that have been irresponsible, had high car taxes, that are getting the benefits of the phase-out. Charlestown, South Kingstown, Block Island, and Westerly weren't nailing people on the car tax. The people I represent haven't been getting a great benefit from this phase-out. Would I like to have it phased out? I would, because I think it's one of those things that out-of-state people look at and say, you know what, there's an unfriendly tax environment. But if we're in the position right now where we, there's no other places to cut and we have to raise taxes, I would get rid of the car tax phase out. That's interesting because, yeah, the speaker and a number of the Democratic lawmakers have d frequently said they think that they find that to be very popular. They talk about it on the doorstep. It's a very different obviously response to that policy down in the neck of the woods where you represent. I'm sure it's popular in Cranston where they weren't responsible and were <laughs> nailing their citizens with high car taxes. I'm sure it's very popular there in Warwick, Providence, Pawtucket, these t places that haven't been responsible with their municipal budgeting and had to kill people in their car taxes. They love it. I want to I want to stick with the car theme real quick. I, I heard you on the public's radio uh, this week, and you floated the idea of getting rid of the DMV. And I'm sure a lot of people <laughs> listening right now would applaud that. But the idea would be to have the, the it all handled by uh, cities and towns. DMV budgets 32 million. 25 million dollars of that comes from the general revenue. The rest is restricted receipts. Of that 25 million. How much would have to go to cities and towns? And I know you don't know off the top of your head, but do you acknowledge some money would have to go to cities and towns in order to help them take on the extra burden of becoming 39 different DMVs? So my position is that, and if you look at what they've done, I actually said Oklahoma, but I believe it's Arizona. Okay. Uh, they have the staff at their town halls now. And there do we have the staff at the town halls now? We do. So we'd, we, we lay, off two, we'd lay off 200 full-time employees at the DMV? I, I haven't gone that far. I think that if there is a way to attain operational efficiency, no one owns their jobs. The state's primary responsibility is to taxpayers, not to maintaining employment of government employees. Uh, so if we can find operational efficiencies, yes, I like those people retrained and put into the, maybe the private sector or other places of government. But if we can save money, empower municipalities to start competing against each other as to who can do a better job, then I think that makes sense. I want to ask you about marijuana policy. Uh, you, you spoke up on the floor uh, toward the end of last year's session as this was being debated and changes were being looked at. It's been a, an ongoing uh, battle between the executive and legislative branches, which is continuing. Uh, the Speaker and the Senate President have just put in another bill to make more changes to medical marijuana regulations, partly in response to the governor suing them <laughs> over their effort to veto her regulations, and, and, and round and round it goes. But I want to ask you specifically, we, we got a statement, my colleague Steph Machado, who's covered this closely, from the cultivator who argue that this bill from, from the Speaker and Senate President could put them out of business by allowing the new compassion centers, which are supposed to be licensed, six more, to grow unlimited amounts of cannabis. Uh, what's your view on that? Do you think they have a, a legitimate gripe? Definitely. So what, what we're doing in this proposed legislation is that we are allowing compassion centers to vertically integrate. Right? They're growing their own product and they're selling it. Uh, we license these cultivators uh, implicitly saying that you will be the supply chain for this new industry. Uh, it was invested, I believe, anywhere from 20 to $25 million of Rhode Island money into being cultivators. And by allowing the compassion centers now to cut out the cultivators, I think that it's going to put these people out of business. I just don't think it's fair, and I think it shows we have a disjointed cannabis policy in the state. What do you think is driving that? I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm sure the cultivators want to be able to grow in their own product. You know, if I were in that business, of or course. the compassion centers. Excuse right? me, yeah, yeah, compassion yeah. centers, I'm sorry. If I was in that business, I'd like to be able to grow my own product and not have to purchase from a third party. I'm sure that's part of it. Uh, I don't know what goes on on the third floor behind the scenes, but of course there's a strong lobby on behalf of the compassion centers wanting to vertically integrate. Uh, maybe that's the right policy, but we shouldn't have, you know, four or five years ago, 
license yeah. all these compassion centers. You know, when we do these policies, we need to think Cultivator. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> cultivators. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm sorry>. Cultivator. <laughs> <laughs> Illustrating how complicated yeah, it is. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, we, we shouldn't have you know, created these licenses yeah. for the cultivators. We should be thinking five, ten years down the line and have a goal that we're trying to get to, not have fits and starts and you know, redos and undermining people who invested in this Let state. me ask you on the same topic, recreational marijuana, right. which it looks like the governor is still going to propose again in her budget, which is coming out next week, and which I would say the Speaker and Senate President have basically already taken off the table. Um, what's your view right now? Is it time for Rhode Island to legalize if, if you were satisfied with the regulations, or is it not time? It's de facto legal now. It's everywhere. It's easier for kids to get pot than it is liquor. With a regulated market, it'll actually make it more difficult for kids to get pot. So you support it? I support it. Mm. I support it. And I support it not because we need the money. I support it because it's a personal choice issue. Do you think there's a choice. generational element to that? You're one of the younger lawmakers. Um, Senate President Ruggiero is of a different generation. Do you just think it's viewed differently by the different generations of lawmakers up there? I think it is. You know, they probably came up in the war on drugs, the just say no, the failed war on drugs. I think they were, you know, in their prime at that time. And things have changed. We've learned more. We see the prevalence of marijuana. It's de facto legal. It's everywhere. All the problems that they're raising, driving while stoned, the employment issues, those are all here now. Those won't be exacerbated by having a legal regulated market. I think those would be mitigated by having a regulated legal market where we can take some of that tax money and put it towards dealing with some of the negative side effects of marijuana. Leader, you push for the independent analysis of the IGT yes. proposal for the lottery contract. How does the, pro uh, the proposal need to change for you to support it, or do you think it needs to go out to bid no matter what? I, listen, I, I want to get the information back. Right? I don't know what our consultant's going to say. The consultant may say, this is the best possible deal. It's wonderful. Go for it. Uh, I think that you can always find the best deal by going out to bid. In lieu of going out to bid, I think we need this study. I'm not set on saying it has to go out to bid. I tr I, you know, I'm going to trust what our consultant says, but I'm very concerned about the, the costs. I'm concerned with the costs for the back, back office behind the machines that runs the floor. You know, we've been told that we're overpaying by, I think, $13 million a year for that. You know, information has come to me showing that our scratch ticket business, we're wildly underperforming. And I'm very concerned about the control of the mix of machines on the floor. We need competition on the floor with the VLTs. And if those three concerns can be mitigated, I would be, it would be acceptable to me not to go out to bed. Um, Kathy Gregg spotted, uh, from the Providence Journal, spotted the heads of uh, Twin River and IGT, or two top executives, conferring in a corridor at the State House the other day, <laughs> which has all of us wondering if there's a negotiation happening for them to end hostilities. I mean, if they come to an agreement and Twin River says, okay, this IGT deal we can support, will that be enough to satisfy you, or will that, would that raise more red flags to you? What would be your reaction? I, I mean, I'd have to know the agreement. I think it's great they're talking. We shouldn't have two of our largest industry, uh, companies in this industry fight with each other, but there's a third party here, and it's the most important party, and it's the state. And whatever they agree to needs to be in the best interest of the state. And if it isn't, we need to find another way forward. So we need to, we need, we need to worry about the taxpayer here, not just the companies. When talk of uh, folks running for governor in two years comes up, your name is uh, often floats out there as someone who might run, uh, you know, as a Republican. Is that something you're considering? I I'm not. I'm flattered, but. I'm not considering it at this point. I'm being the minority leader. I love this job. I think it's too early. Um, right now, I'm not considering it. Yeah, okay, but yeah, we have to check. Is that right now, and so I won't be doing it, or just I'm not thinking about it yet, but I might think about it later? This business is crazy. I don't think people who have like, <laughs> can plan three years ahead. I really don't. I, I love the job I'm doing now. I love serving the state, if there's other opportunities possibly, but I just don't see it at this point. All right, I'm overdue for a commercial, but I'm gonna ask you one more question on politics. You, you were first elected as an independent, um, then you switched to the Republican Party. Um, I think it's safe to say the Republican Party changed somewhat from when you uh, switched over. Do you have any reservations about where the party is now, or have you ever considered going back to being an independent, or are you happy the way things are? Well, I've always put principle over party. I think the Republican Party now in this state, I think they're really focused on the bread and butter, financial issues, and good government issues. Um, I am a Republican, but I'm sitting here advocating for the legalization of marijuana. You know, we're not national Republicans. I, I think it's a, a good party. I think we have the right message. And I think people need to listen to it, and I think we should not be, have our districts gerrymandered as much as they are, uh, because right now, under the last election, we'd had over 20 Republicans. 
in the legislature if we didn't have the messed up gerrymandering in the state. So I think the Republican Party is making the right moves. I think we have the right message. And I think if we get good candidates, we can win and grow. House Minority Leader uh, Blake Filippi, thanks so much for joining us on the program. By the way, if you think this business is hard, we're talking about journalism on the second <laughs> half. Our guest is the publisher of the Warwick Beacon, John Howell, a legendary newsman celebrating 50 uh, years. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. To my left, Eyewitness News reporter Ted Nisi. Our guest on the second half is John Howell. He's the publisher of the Warwick Beacon and celebrating 50 years at the helm there. Um, John, you know, publisher is a, is a lofty title, but Ted took this picture at the State House uh, the other day, which I think uh, illustrates nicely what I'm about to say about you. And you are still out there. There you are taking a picture of Ted. Yes. Take it. That's so meta. Ted, <laughs> you take a picture of Ted, Ted taking a picture of you. But look, we're at the State House, and we say publisher, which people think you're sitting in a stuffy office looking at spreadsheets. That's not the case. We, you know, reporters see you out there all the time pounding the pavement. What, do you love the job being a reporter? Is that why you got into being a publisher, is to get out there and practice journalism? Well, I started off with a paper in uh, Port Chester, New York. It was a daily paper, and uh, I worked there for two years, uh, and it was a very competitive environment. I was covering Greenwich, Connecticut, and there were two other papers covering Greenwich at the time, the Greenwich Time and the St uh, Stanford Advocate. And <clears throat> they were dailies, afternoon dailies, which you don't see anymore yeah. today. And the reporters from each of the papers would get together around noon for lunch and see who had scooped the other. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> this environment of competition, uh, you know, unfortunately you don't see as much today, the, you know, given the social media, people tend to say that that's what the word is. but. When I started out, that really got into my blood. And uh, I found myself, from there I went to work for the Hartford Times, found myself wanting to, to run a paper, and came to the state uh, in 1968 to uh, actually run the East Providence Post. And that's where I met uh, Tony Ritaco, who became my partner in founding a company that bought the Beacon. Um, Did you ever think, John, 1969, you buy the paper, that you would be here in 2020, still running it, still the publisher? I never imagined that. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, and at the time, I never imagined that I would actually end up owning a paper, because I didn't have the money to buy it. And Because uh, the paper cost $40,000 to buy, right? In 1969 dollars. That's right. Yeah. And what amazed me, uh, was I formed a company, issued stock, and in a week's time, we sold the stock. <laughs> yeah. So even then, there was, uh, or maybe more so then, uh, people were really interested in uh, communications and the news. And I found, obviously, the right people to invest in the company, and that's what started it. We should, we should mention, we've been talking a lot about the Warwick Beacon, uh, the company's Beacon Communications that encompasses also the Cranston Herald and the Johnson Sunrise. You brought some props here. Ted, if you could pick up this thing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. this is look a, at this, look at <laughs> See if we can Where do you put the coal shot? in that to run it? Uh, this is, uh, <laughs> uh, it looks like from the 80s. It says Radio Shack right on it. It's how you used to uh, file stories at the time. <laughs> That's right. right. Um, so we've got, you've got this little screen uh, <laughs> you've got, let's see what this I... This is horrible for our Radio podcast. Radio Shack <laughs> TRS-80 John, Mo Model 100 Portable Computer. When did you get this? I think <laughs> it was in the 80s. We had maybe four of them. They were expensive at the time. At least they seemed to be to me. Like yeah. Maybe four or five hundred dollars. Yeah. And you're right. You would only get four lines of copy here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then you would type on this, bring it in, download it into another computer, and that computer would spit out uh, galleys of type uh, that you had to then cut and paste 
and lay out the format <laughs> of the paper. <laughs> it, it must, so. It's gotten easier to oh, lay out oh, the well, paper, yeah. right? I mean, it, it, that must be a nice part of the rise. Is, yeah. <laughs> so you filed a lot of stories through that in, uh, in typewriters right. before that. What's right. your most memorable? Of the terms of stories? Yeah. Oh, there are a whole bunch I of I mean, you got Blizzard of 78. Yeah, right. the Blizzard of 78. Uh, you know, one of the stories I think that, uh, you know, so impacted Warwick, and I remember the time very clearly, uh, were the Craig Price murders. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that period following the murders, where they were looking for a suspect and the community as a whole. A suspect, a serial killer. Right, right. A, serial right. a serial killer. killer. Right. Yeah. And knowing that you had this killer in your midst, mm. now, of course, not knowing who it was, and that just that feeling within the community of somebody, you know, is here, a killer amongst mm. us. People were nailing their windows shut oh, at that time. They were. I mean, talk about a story that impacts a community right. and you had to be, to be all over. Do you feel that, that service, that pressure to... Responsibility. To, responsibility is the word I'm looking for, to mm. the community with a story like that? Oh, definitely you do. But you wonder, you know, how far do you play it? Do you, because you don't want to uh, exacerbate the situation mm -hmm. with, you know, whether it's faults or even, you know. One of the things that I think that impressed me most about that were talking to the, the cops that did the investigation, the detectives, and the the morning that they went out into the backyard of Craig's Price's place and dug up the knife that was used for this, and he fell asleep on the couch. Right. Yeah, while that was going on. While that was going on, which him, huh? tells you something about him. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, John, I want to ask you, we, part of what I want to talk was about, everyone wonders about the future of newspapers right now. Yeah. I got my start in newspapers. Uh, Tim's family has quite a history in newspapers. There is a difference I find between the big national papers, the daily metro papers like the Journal, like the Boston Globe, and then the community papers like yours, which have a, a, a very specific geographic base. I mean, how do you feel about the long-term outlook for the Beacon Communications papers themselves, and more broadly for the community newspaper sector of the industry? It's been said that we've been uh, community papers have been somewhat uh, insulated from what's happened with, you know, the larger metro papers that have tried to cover such, you know, you know, the whole turf, so to speak. And we've carved out an area saying that's local. And I think there's going to always be a, an interest uh, on, on the part of people, you know, pick up something tangible, mm -hmm. have that feel to it, be able to read the story. And if it's about their kids or, you know, somebody's you know made the honor roll whatever cut that out circle it put it on to the refrigerator it it's going to hold but can newspapers make enough money to sustain that kind of operation that i think is the tough tough thing that that we face uh, how is it today is it do you feel is it stable as a business you know do you do you worry for the beacon or do you feel fairly good about its prospects at the moment at least I worry, you know, for community papers across the country. I think they all face the same sort of thing. We, you know, we talk between ourselves or associations. You look at what other people are doing. Uh, we don't happen to have a paywall, for example, on our uh, website. We started our website in the year 2000. You know, it's been around for a while. Mm -hmm. And we have, you know, we can look at the demographics of that and see that we've got, you know, 18,000 or so regular readers to our, our website. And I'm at a point saying, yeah, we're providing this for free. Meanwhile, our paid circulation is going down. Mm. So I'm looking at putting a paywall in, for example. But I think the longer range uh, future is really to do a little bit of what uh, Gates, Gatehouse has done on a metro level or across the country, consolidate some of our production operations between local newspapers, mm -hmm. but maintain that uh, relationship with the community and the, re the relationship you know, with reporters to the community as well as salespeople. Mm -hmm. 
uh, because obviously without the salespeople and the advertising, we be facing a hurdle. Can so, yeah, go ahead. Can and we I have show about a minute left here. About a minute left. I just want to show John brought with him, and again, I'll ask our uh, great crew back there to come into my shot. We have, this is, is this this current edition? That's the, yes. the current oh, edition. We tape on a Friday. So. We tape on a Friday. This is the very first, this is before John, to be clear. This is 1953, volume one, number one of the Warwick Beacon. And uh, John, it's, it's changed quite a bit. Now, you did acknowledge this was a reprint. Right, right, that you guys right, did to right. celebrate an anniversary, but uh, it's gotten a good bit bigger, that's for sure. If we zoom <laughs> out a little, <laughs> sheet, see yeah. you've added to it or <laughs> yes. whatever, but you must be very proud. Yes. Yeah. You should be proud, and uh, I, I want to make sure I say this before we run out of time, because we have about 30 right. seconds left in the uh, show. Journalism, when done right, which you have done, serves a community, and your community, and journalists like us uh, owe you a big uh, gratitude of thanks for the work that you've done, the devotion you have given to the craft. You've made it better and you've made the community better. So congratulations on 50 years. Well, thank you. I still don't plan to scoop you now. <laughs> Bring, yeah, right. Bring it on, Howell. Bring it on. 30 it. seconds of sentiment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then we go back to war. <laughs> John Howell, publisher of the Warwick Beacon. Thank you so much for joining us on the program. If you missed any of it, it's online, WPRI.com. And don't forget the podcast.